Hey there guys, really quick video for you today on robbery. Um, the reason this video is so quick is because robbery is very simply theft with the use of force. And if you haven't already seen it, then you can click in the top right corner and you can watch my video on theft and that'll be half of your answer. And this short video is basically going to cover the definition of force, although I don't think that'll take much time, mainly because it's given its ordinary meaning um, as we use it in everyday life. So as I said, robbery is theft with the use of force, although if you do want a much fuller definition for use in a coursework uh, question or an exam, then you can look to section 8 of the Theft Act 1968 for that. We're going to focus on those two key elements though. Um, theft, as I mentioned, you can look in more detail at my other video. The only thing that I would say for the purposes of this video is that there's no offence of robbery without the actual theft. Um, this might seem an obvious point that was confirmed in 1968, but Harris is a really interesting case that demonstrates that. In Harris, the defendant beat at the victim, and while the victim was lying out cold on the pavement, Harris thought, oh well, while I'm here, I might as well steal the guy's wallet as well. Um, and he was prosecuted for robbery, um, but in actual fact, he was only convicted for offences against the person and theft. Essentially, the court saw the two incidents, i.e. beating up the victim and stealing from the victim, as two separate things. Um, the theft wasn't used with the force, and therefore it couldn't be robbery. Now the force itself, as I mentioned in the introduction, is just given its ordinary meaning as you'd use it in daily life. Um, so it's kind of up to the jury to give a definition of force and similarly in an exam or a coursework it'll be up to you to try and give an ordinary definition as well. There might be a few cases that you want to look at. Um, I've given Dawson and James there from 1976. Um, there are some cases where nudging is seen as a sufficient amount of force um, but I think that that's probably dependent on the context. So if it's um, a busy Saturday afternoon in a shopping centre then everyone Everyone's kind of nudging against each other and so that probably wouldn't be enough to amount to force but if you deliberately nudged into someone with um, high impact in a secluded area where there's no need to then that would probably be regarded as um, force so it's dependent on the meaning that the jury would give it and also probably on the context of the case as well. Now, some of the other definitions I put there at the bottom, two and three are interesting to contrast. So putting the victim in fear of force as well as seeking to put the victim in fear of force. Now, the reason that that third one's added in is because if, for example, I went up to Mike Tyson or Conor McGregor and tried to put them in fear of force, the chances are they wouldn't be very scared of little old me. But that's not really fair to not convict me of robbery simply because the victim wasn't particularly scared of me. And so we have that third point, seeking to put the victim in fear of force, that looks a lot more closely at what the intention of the defendant was. Um, a similarly interesting point is the implied or continuing threat of force. And this is where a threat of force is made and continues to be made over a significant period of time, sometimes as long as a day or a couple of days. And it's only towards the end of that period that the theft actually takes place. Um, so you, it, this eff effectively accounts for a situation where a threat of force is made and as long as the later theft occurs and the victim has in mind that original threat of force when the theft takes place, then that will be sufficient to count as robbery. And this can maybe be contrasted with the earlier Harris case that I mentioned, where they were clearly distinct things. In um, Donaghy and Marshall, the victim was still operating under the... Um, threat of the original force that was used. I think in that case he was a taxi driver um, who had been threatened by the defendants. So the final point before we finish is that um, while the theft, uh, the force has to be made um, before or during the theft, this is given a very broad definition as we can see in Hale 1978. And so in this case there were two defendants 
One defendant went upstairs and uh, stole a jewellery box. The other defendant was downstairs and he was tying up the victim. But it wasn't clear which occurred first. Was it the force that occurred first, the tying up of the victim, or the theft of the jewellery box upstairs that happened first? And in theory, if we applied a strict interpretation, then if the theft had occurred first, we wouldn't be able to convict those two defendants of robbery. However, uh, the Court of Appeal took a very broad approach to this. They saw the theft as a continuing act. And so as long as the force was used as part of that continuing act, um, then that would be sufficient to allow for a conviction of robbery. Um, <clears throat> those of you who have watched my other video um, might be aware of theft being seen as a finite act. And so contrasting those two points um, might be an interesting point of discussion, especially if you're doing an essay. Sorry, I think I was losing my voice towards the end of that uh, recording. Um, thank you very much for watching this video on robbery. If you did enjoy it, then make sure to leave it a like and you can also subscribe for more videos. Um, there's loads of other stuff on my channel, not just that video on theft, but there's also other stuff on criminal defences that you may find useful if you're working on this for um, an essay or a coursework or an exam question. Um, also, if you do have any questions or comments from this video, then make sure to leave those below as well. And the only thing left to say is uh, thank you very much for watching. Bye.